Hi guys, today we're going to be going over shore face depositional environments. And on this source to sink figure that we always show before we get into the depositional environment itself, this red outline indicates where shore face environments occur. Before we can get into the deposition and stratigraphy of shore face environments, we have to talk about the processes that dominate shore face environments. This includes waves, which have an internal velocity in the wave orbital and a forward external velocity from the wind. And that forward velocity increases when the wave orbitals begin to hit the bottom sediment. And I'll talk about this in a little more detail when I go over this figure on the bottom right, step by step. But basically, because velocity is greater during the swash, meaning when the waves are coming into shore and you're standing on the sand and your feet get wet, that's the swash. And then the velocity is less intense during the backswash, when the waves go back offshore, this velocity difference creates a difference in the sediment that is carried onto land. There's a sorting of finer sand back toward the deep water that occurs during the backswash, and coarser sand preferentially moves landward because of the greater velocity during the swash. Therefore, in the swash backswash zone, we have fine coarse grain sand grading going on, going from further offshore to further onshore. Now to look at this figure of wave orbitals and what happens when they hit the bottom sediment and begin to break? Let's go through this step by step. First, we have the furthest out wave orbitals that are not hitting the bottom sediment yet and have a constant internal velocity in a circular or orbital motion. And we can see that the wave orbitals only go so deep and the intensity of the wave orbital or size in the case of this figure, it's smaller as we go down in depth. This is because wind, which causes waves to form, only can go so deep into the ocean. And so it only affects surface water and at some point in the depth there is no wave activity going on. So waves have not only a top surface which is the surface of the water but also a bottom surface where there is no more orbitals going on. So this bottom surface is at the bottom of the very last orbital and at some point that bottom orbital hits the bottom sediment as that wave moves toward land. When the orbitals hit the bottom sediment the bottom orbitals begin to move slower than the top ones causing a slanting of the wave orbitals which causes faster forward velocity and this eventually causes the waves to break as they go further into shore and when the wave crests break this is called the breaker zone next we have currents currents can be longshore currents and rip currents longshore currents are currents that go roughly toward the shore and rip currents represent an outsource of energy between where waves are breaking or the rip channel moving directly away from shore however we're going to focus on longshore currents because they cause a type of deposition called longshore drift. Because longshore currents typically go toward the shore at an oblique angle, this causes the path at which longshore currents go onto shore, shown in the bottom right figure, to be different than the path to which the currents go back offshore, and this causes a zigzag motion of sand particles. And this causes something called longshore drift. Longshore drift transports sediments by longshore currents, and this causes the directional migration of sand particles along a shoreline. Now getting into into the body parts of a shore face environment. Overall, shore face environments include a lower, a middle, and an upper shore face moving from further offshore to further onshore. There's a dashed line here marking the boundary between lower shore face and offshore, and this line is represented by FWWB. This FWWB stands for Fair Weather Wave Base. This is the wave base we talked about in the first slide, where we saw the figure of the waves having orbitals that go down to a certain boundary where the orbital stops, and the base of that bottom orbital is called the wave base. This wave base can be lengthened, meaning the orbitals can go further down, deeper into the water, depending on if there is a storm that is occurring. This is because storms cause stronger winds, and stronger winds cause deeper penetration of orbitals. So if we had stormy weather, you would get a storm wave base, or an SWB, lower than the FWWB, which would cause shore face sedimentary structures in the offshore environment, basically lengthening the lower shore face environment to further offshore. Additionally, another thing that high energy waves can cause is coarser sediment, of course, is sand on beaches with high energy waves. And finally, to get to the stratigraphy of shore face environments, we have here the figure on the upper right that we were looking at on the last slide showing the lower, middle, and shore face environments respectively. And now we 
have a stratigraphic column to go with that figure. First, I'm going to restate Walther's law, which I've talked about in previous lectures, which basically states that laterally adjacent environments are shown in vertical succession in stratigraphic columns. This is why this lower, middle, and upper shore face environment, which are adjacent to each other in a real life environment, can then be shown on a stratigraphic column in the rock record in vertical succession to each other. Now let's go through this stratigraphic column step by step. We will go from the foreshore environment to the upper shore face to the middle shore face to the lower shore face offshore transition zone. First, starting with the foreshore environment, we can see that planar bedding or lamination is the dominant sedimentary bed form in the beach foreshore environment, which is due to the velocity and grain sizes. An example of planar lamination is shown in this picture. And now we can move to the breaker zone or upper shore face environment, which is dominated by climbing ripples and trough cross stratification. Moving on to the mid and lower shore face environment, we have the dominant sedimentary structures being swaley cross stratification in the middle shore face, hummocky cross stratification in the lower shore face, and bioturbation common in both, which we'll talk about at the end of this video. Also, the grain sizes in the mid to lower shore face are becoming finer from sand to silt rather than fully sand. Another thing to take into account is that swaley and hummocky cross stratification are always linked, but in the mid shore face, swales or the depressions are better preserved than the hummocks and hummocky cross stratification preserved in the lower shore face typically preserves the hummocks and the swales and is termed hummocky cross stratification. The lower shore face then grades down to planar lamination with bioturbation in the offshore zone. Now, just to make some distinctions between some sedimentary structures here so we all know what we're talking about. First, I'm going to start on the top right here on this figure showing ripples. We have symmetrical ripples highlighted in yellow, which are typical of bidirectional flow. This is what makes them symmetrical. And this is typical of the upper shore face environment, whereas asymmetrical ripples, now also highlighted in yellow on the left of that figure in the top right, are typical of unidirectional flow. So things like river systems, aeolian systems with a consistent wind direction, etc. But this also occurs in shore face environments, but not in the upper shore face. It occurs further onshore, typically in the foreshore region, where waves begin to have a consistent forward velocity, which is not met by the backswash. Now moving on to trough cross bedding and hummocky and swaley cross bedding, we have C and D figures in the lower left. First C, which I've now highlighted in yellow, is trough cross bedding, where beds cut across troughs of other beds, which is why it's called trough cross. And so we can see there's a big difference between how that looks in its cross section compared to the much lower angle waves of hummocky and swaley cross bedding. In hummocky and swaley cross bedding, we have beds that do not cut across each other sharply and the curves, like I said, are on a much shallower angle. So basically you can think of it of the more high energy trough cross bedded zones and the further onshore areas of the shore face grading down into more calm zones of hummocky and swaley cross bedding, grading down into planar bedding in the very, very calm area of offshore where wave orbitals are no longer reaching. And now that we have that understood a little better, we'll move on to transgressive and regressive sequences. Transgression is the movement of the shoreline landward, whereas regression is the movement of the shoreline basinward. During transgression, we can see that the sand of the upper shore face foreshore environment becomes onlapped or overlain by the shale of the mid to lower to offshore environment, which becomes onlapped by the limestone of the more abyssal plain environment. And then the opposite occurs during regression, where the limestone will be overlain with the shale and the shale with the sandstone. And this is called offlap. Transgression, onlap, regression, offlap. Pretty simple. So if you come up to an outcrop and you see a sandstone to shale to limestone sequence grading upward, you can make some interpretation that that might have been a transgressive sequence. Alternatively, you can see that in a limestone to shale to sandstone sequence, you might be able to say that is a regressive sequence. Lastly, just some definitions regarding transgression and regression. I want to mention that you might hear the words retrogradation and progradation. Basically, the sequence order that you will find in a transgressive sequence, so on the top of this figure, will sometimes be called retrogradation and a regressive sequence 
sequence will sometimes be called progradation. Now I just want to show this figure so you can see how the stratigraphy can be affected by transgression and regression events. Because the movement of the shoreline and the movement of pretty much any geological system like I talked about in previous videos is pretty much constant, everything's always migrating, you'll see these transgression and regression sequences pretty consistently throughout the rock record. And during transgression, you'll get erosional surfaces from wave orbitals disturbing sediment that was deposited during regression. And a term you might see regarding this first bed deposited during the flooding of a transgressive sequence following regression might be called a revinement surface. And likewise, if you see a regressive sequence following transgression, you might see that the boundary between the two is called the maximum flooding surface. Lastly, we'll talk about some trace fossils, or the ichnophases, that occur in different zones of the shore face environment. These include Solonomycnus. Salonicnus, Salonicnus, Salonicnus. Um, this one highlighted here in a red and shown in the figure with the white circle showing the kinds of structures it makes. Additionally, you might get Scolithos and Opiomorpha. Thank goodness those are easier to pronounce. And these are shown in the bottom left figure with Scolithos in the white circle with straight burrows downward and Opiomorpha with larger, more branching burrows. Then you might get in the lower shore phase to transition to offshore environment, Cruziana and Zuphicos. Cruziana is in the upper left figure showing in the yellow circle the kind of burrows it makes on the bottom of sediment. Additionally, Zuphicos is shown on the lower right figure where we can see the type of structure it would create in the sediment. That is all for today's lecture, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned about what processes dominate the shore phase environment and control the deposition in this environment, what sedimentary structures occur in each different zone of the shore phase, the difference between transgression and regression, and how they can affect the stratigraphy of the shore phase environment, and a little bit about the trace fossils we can find in these sediments. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.